Okay, so assuming now that you have your chart and we're back on the video, um, what is human design? So zooming out to this bigger picture of why do we care about this? What is this chart and what's the point? Um, the best way to sum it up that I found is it's science of differentiation. And very simply, that is the idea that we are all unique, that we are all as unique as our thumbprint, our DNA, um, our energy fingerprint is unique to us. And this map, this human design chart is a picture of how your circuitry is wired. Inside the human form, there is a set energetic circuitry that exists and we'll call that potential. And then based on the energy they imprinted on you when you were born, you have a certain energetic fingerprint. You have a defined set of how you flow energy through your system. And so this, this human design chart is basically a diagram of your unique circuitry. So because it's assuming right from the start that this is unique, this is a very powerful tool for self-mastery for self-understanding and understanding patterns that have existed in your whole life. Like this isn't going to be probably new information. When you start reading about your human design chart, it's going to be like reading about the life you've lived thus far. And if anything, giving you a helpful context to kind of put the pieces together around why are you living the patterns that you're living? And if you're not enjoying those patterns, then what are some tools to help you work with the way your energy is wired to help you live something that you'll enjoy more? So very, very powerful. <laughs> and when we say like, how much are you enjoying your life? It's a question of your average mood, your average being like, you know, average 365 days, that's a year, like put all of those daily moods together. And that's your average enjoyment of your life. So how is it? Could it be better? Probably. I mean, who's couldn't? Um, and so this is a tool for moving towards a better existence for you personally. Um, yeah, human design really like just explodes this idea that there is such thing as a cookie cutter life. There's no recipe that any of us can follow other than the feeling of our own individual energetic circuitry. So this is a, a means to an end to understand how we're wired as individuals. So in that web of understanding how we're wired, what do our energy centers tell us? Um, two concepts exist here in this space of energy centers. The first is conditioning. So that's a word that you'll read a lot when you start reading stuff about human design. And it's a very important idea and something to be aware of. And in the earlier parts of our lives, we, I mean, we come in as very impressionable. We come in as this blank slate and our identity somewhat um, gets written onto us by the environment that we live in when we're small. And so that's conditioning, that, that taking on and soaking up and embodying the beliefs and the ways of being of the people around you. And so that it, it doesn't have to be inherently bad, you know, like when you take stuff in, you may be exposed to something that really does work for you. And you want to keep that because you really like it. You know, this person, you witnessed it in them. You really like it. You want it for yourself. Great. Hang on to that. That's cool. I'm talking about things that like you do it because your dad did it, but when you do it, it doesn't really feel good, but like he did it and you don't want him to think that you're not like cool. Like he, like, it's like that. Like, when it doesn't feel good to you personally, that's conditioning in a negative form, you know, where we're denying ourselves then in favor of being like those that we're sharing an environment with, like our parents or our friends or lots of different ways, basically anywhere you go, that your energy can be influenced or conditioned. And as a result of conditioning, we wind up with not self behavior. And this is another concept in human design in general, that basically these are the rumble strips on the highway. 
So when you're experiencing your not self behavior, which basically just means you're whacked out and you're not, you don't feel good and you're not acting good and you don't like the way you're acting, but maybe you don't even know how to change the way you're acting. Um, not self, <laughs> right? You're out of control. Been there, been there, done that many times. Um, like when we're burnt out, when we start getting snappy at other people because we've lost our patience because we let ourselves get all run down and stuff because we pushed ourselves too hard because we didn't know when enough was enough. And now we're overwhelmed. We're exhausted. We're, we are not our best self, not self. Um, and basically it's how we're behaving when we are out of sync with who we truly are. When you are being overly conditioned and you're acting in a way that you think is in alignment with your conditioning, but it opposes your true self, that is where not self behavior is generated from. So when you're in your not self behavior, it's helpful to understand that I feel this way because I'm following somebody else's compass. If I were following my own internal compass, I would feel better right now. So maybe let me turn inward. Let me take some alone time. Let me go into my journal and explore my thoughts or talk to a trusted friend or therapist or life coach or whatever and figure out like, what is your internal compass? Because when we're living from that, we're living from our authentic self. That's the opposite of conditioning. And that is our, our authentic self is our real self. And that's where we want to be coming from in our lives in order to achieve the greatest happiness. Is it required to live from your authentic self? No. And a lot of people don't. And that's cool. It's not required at all, but it's the source of happiness and well-being and abundance, as we'll see later, a little foreshadowing for what's to come. So there is another concept. This is really where we're getting a little bit deeper into energy centers. And what really caught my eye was this difference between having a defined energy center or an open or undefined energy center. And so just so we're clear, the energy centers are these shapes, the triangle, square, the diamond, the little triangle, all of these shapes are the nine energy centers. And if the energy center is colored in, meaning it's a color, whatever color it is, um, that means it's defined. And we're going to get into how does something get defined here just a little bit later. If it's white or clear, it's open. So it's not actually white, it is clear, it's empty. And that is where conditioning happens. Anywhere you have an open center in your chart, that is where you're taking on the energy from the, the environment. And the more centers you have open, the more sensitive you are to the, the energy of your environment. So it's a source of being pulled away from your authentic self because you have this risk of absorbing the identities and the thoughts and the energies of other people and the wisdom, the source of unique brilliance that comes with these open centers is to learn how to distinguish what's mine and what am I picking up from other people. And if it's something that I've picked up from other people, is it something that I want to keep or is it something that I want to let go of? And then if it's something you want to let go of, you let go of it. So with those open centers, it's so important to be aware of the hygiene of those centers and make sure that they're not holding on to things that don't even belong to you that are blocking the flows of your energy. Um, the wisdom that comes with our open centers is that we basically learn to let go. There's a lot of trust and in that trust wisdom that comes from living with these open centers and having to master that energy before it's mastered, it feels very chaotic. Typically our open centers would be the source of depression and anxiety. And like when you have those centers open, it's basically an inconsistent source of energy because you're not producing it yourself. In the defined centers, you're generating your own energy. In the open centers, you're taking it on from your environment. So in alone time, for example, nobody else in your house, just you, you're not taking on any energy from anybody else. And in that moment, it can feel really uncomfortable if you're out of whack with your open centers, because now, like, for example, like, let's say the identity center is open. Like in this picture, it's defined because it's colored in, but if it were open, in alone time, you feel like you don't know who you are. 
you have a total lack of sense of self because you're no longer taking in energy that fuels your identity. You're all by yourself and you don't produce identity energy naturally. So that is part of the anxiety and the potential depression and unhappiness that can come from those open centers. But learning to master them is our, our path to our own brilliance and wisdom. So you can also, this is just another example to kind of pull them apart and like, how do they really function? Those, those, um, so it's like a, a sponge versus a glass paperweight and you put them both into water and the sponge is obviously going to take on the water from its environment. The glass paperweight is going to sink straight to the bottom and will not absorb water. And that's the difference between a defined center and an open center. So it's, it's not good or bad. There isn't a right way or a wrong way. It's a matter of understanding how your unique energy functions. And if you are a sponge, it's important to wring that sponge out every once in a while, like every day, you know, like empty it back out on purpose so that you can be aware of like, what's yours and what did you pick up from somebody else that maybe doesn't even have anything to do with your life? So it's, it's not good or bad. It's just a matter of understanding and studying the art of studying ourselves. Okay, so back to just a little bit of foundation before we continue into the deep dives. Um, so the human design types, when you look at your, your human design chart, the printout, uh, up at the top, the very first thing it tells you is what type you are. And you see that 66% of everybody are generators, and that includes manifesting generators. So if you, if it says either one of those generator or manifesting generator, that's both in the generator category, because what makes a generator is this, this sacral center being defined. So if you have your sacral center defined, meaning it's colored in on your chart, and we're going to get into which one's a sacral, um, we're going to cover all that. Just know that that means, and actually it's this one right here. It's this little red one, which is the second square from the bottom. So if that's defined, then you're a generator. That's what makes you a generator. And if your throat is also defined, that's what makes you a manifesting generator. So just plain generators, they have a sacral defined and not the throat. So the everybody else doesn't have their sacral defined. So you see that 66% of people have it defined and the other third doesn't. So out of that other third, there's three different types. Uh, projectors are another 22%. And that means that they don't have a defined sacral center. And they also don't have a defined throat center. And that means that they're a non-energy type. Like they, they don't generate energy. They don't manifest themselves. They, they project their energy. I, I projector is like the hardest one for me to understand. So I'm going to just like leave it at that. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll do a more in-depth video just on the four types and like really diving deep into those types and the strategies for each of them. Um, but I do know definition is no sacral, no throat. And then manifestors, um, 9%, 10%, uh, they don't have the sacral defined and they have their throat defined. So that's the difference between a projector and a manifester is the de definition of the throat. And then a reflector, which you see it's only 1%. I would love to meet a reflector in person. I think it would be so cool. Basically they have all of their centers open. So I Googled famous reflectors and Sandra Bullock is like one of the main ones that came up. And there were articles written about like how she uses her reflectorness to like step into the roles, the characters that she plays um, and that she like literally embodies that persona. Um, like she becomes a different person and just like any open center, you know, just because they have them all open, basically it can be extremely chaotic when you're young and as you learn to master it, it's like a buffet where every single center is open, meaning you have access to taste anything on the buffet that you want. With any of your open centers, like you get to try on lots of different energies and mindsets and 
personas and lots of different stress levels and on and on and on. And that the beauty of that is as you learn discernment, as you grow in your self-awareness, in your true authentic identity, we are able to keep the pieces that really resonate with who we truly are and let go of the ones that aren't for us, that those don't fit with who we truly are. We picked it up from somebody along our path. We tried it on. Uh, it kind of itches me in the weird spot. So I'm going to take it back off and just leave it there. You don't have to wear around something that doesn't feel good. And that's really the wisdom of those open centers is to set down the stuff that doesn't feel good. But we're going to get more into all of that.